Welcome everyone um, to the December 6, 2021 meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. This meeting of the Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 and the extension due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. RB is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. So I would like to now confirm that all uh, members of the Redevelopment Board are present and can hear me, starting with Kin Lau. Yes. Dean Benson. Present. Melissa Tentopoulos. Present. Steve Bredelak. Good evening, Madam Chair. And I am Rachel Zemberry, uh, Chair, and I am here. And we have two members of the Department of Planning and Community Development, uh, Jennifer Raitt. Present. And Kelly Lineman. Who is here and may be jumping over <laughs> to the select meeting as we speak. Um, so let's see, uh, with that, I'd like to uh, go ahead and, well, Jenny, is our applicant here for docket number 3680, the public hearing um, for Citizens Bank? Um, I do not see the representative from Citizens Bank here with us this evening, unless, uh, as you've just announced, we are seeking the representative of Citizens Bank. I do not see them, however. Okay. Um, well, if they're not here, I think what I would do is um, request that we um, that we postpone the hearing and um, defer it to uh, our available meeting if there is room on that agenda. Jenny, do you know if uh, the December, I think it's December 20 is our next meeting um, that we could continue this to? I, I might suggest that you take an administrative item and then come back because yeah. it's only four after um, and okay. then come and see if somebody arrives. Sure, we, we can have do that. had, you know, everybody has a challenge sometimes joining and I no think problem. it's worth waiting. Um, so why don't we uh, put a pin in this item and we'll go ahead and move to agenda item number five, the meeting minutes, um, and take care of those while we wait to see if any other member um, from the applicant team is joining us this evening. Um, so I'd like to go ahead, Jenny, if you could bring up the meeting minutes from um, November 1st. We'll go ahead and review those and see if any members of the board have any uh, modifications to the meeting minutes. And I will start with you, Jean. Uh, yes, thank you. I have two proposed modifications. On the first page, the second paragraph, which is right on the screen now, the third line said, Says Barbara Nessie said he's taking a look at the case and relief requests. I think it should be requests relief instead of relief requests. One paragraph up, Jenny. Third line. Yes, I think it should say requests relief. Relief request. Request, I guess, requests relief not relief requests. Okay. I mean, it would, it would be better to say that he requests he be allowed to withdraw his application without prejudice. Take a new look, the case requests permission to withdraw his application without prejudice or the application without prejudice. Um, that's the sentence before, though. Are you? Right. So then we can just say requests for leave. That's fine. OK, and a new application will be filed. Right. And then on the second page, mm -hmm. we go to the second page. Uh, 
um, the sentence, the second sentence at the top where it said, Mr. Benson said he is interested in the possibility of the change being retroactive or not, that's not exactly right. What the discussion was about was um, places with existing um, parking and whether if they had to come for a special permit for something else, whether the new parking would be retroactive for that particular location. Is there more that you want to well, add? Well, parking being retroactive or not at existing locations, which at some point would need to apply for a special permit. And it should say at an existing location. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. I'd like to suggest the amendments. Great. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Kim, any modifications? No, I don't think I was here most of that meeting. Okay. Melissa? Melissa, did you have any modifications? No, Jean took my modifications. Okay. <laughs> I'll give it back, <laughs> Melissa. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. And uh, Steve, any modifications? Uh, I do have a few. Um, not many. On the bottom of page one, the very last sentence, um, where it reads, Mr. Revelak said he would like to know if there has been a cost per unit under both. Um, I'd like to, I would propose striking, know if there has been, and replacing it with the word C. Yep, that those words. And then after unit, after cost per unit, insert the word model. So Mr. Revelock said he would like to see a cost per unit model under both regulations. And then uh, the second one is just punctuation on page two. Uh, in the second paragraph, one, two, three, four lines from the bottom. Um, the sentence, the clause, wording the use description as temporary group activities conducted by profit and nonprofit organizations. Um, I'd propose putting uh, open quotes before temporary group activities and close quotes after nonprofit organizations. Yep. And that is all I had. The period goes inside the quotation, not outside. Ooh. Content, please. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody right. hear that siren? Uh, <laughs> I have I have two small modifications. One, Jenny, is on this mm -hmm. page um, mm -hmm. in the paragraph below where you just were, where we talked about um, uh, the open the public comments for the for these articles. So I received a, a note from um, Don Seltzer clarifying his remarks for the minutes that I would just want to update. Um, so where at the, the last um, sentence here where he says, Mr. Seltzer said that the open space use should be included with the town bylaws, not the zoning bylaws. Um, I think we should change that to Mr. Seltzer said that issuing special permits where temporary open space is more appropriate in the town bylaw than the zoning bylaw. Great. And then my other modification is on page one. Um, it's just on the vote related to the continuation of the first um, hearing. So I think that's in. Uh, yeah, it's the top of what is showing there where it says four to zero, Mr. Lau is absent. Um, if you go up a little, I think to the, to the actually the earlier 
one paragraph above. Yes, it's that paragraph there. So um, where it says Ms. Tintakal is seconded, approved, it should have been three to zero because um, Mr. Revelak was uh, not able to vote on. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Great, uh, are there any other modifications? Okay, seeing none, uh, is there a motion to approve the meeting minutes from November 1st, 2021 as amended? So moved. A second. Second. We'll take a roll call vote, starting with Jean. Yes. Ken. Um, I'm going to abstain. Okay. Uh, Melissa. Yes. Steve. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Those meeting minutes are approved as amended. Uh, we'll now move to the meeting minutes from November 15th, 2021. And as Jenny brings us up on the screen, I will start with Jean for any additions or corrections. I have two. Okay. One, one is on the exceedingly long paragraph that starts halfway down the first page and continues for most of the second page. About uh, a third of the way down the page, there's a line that starts with support. You see that? Um, where in the paragraph? It's about, roughly, it's about, roughly on the first page or on the second page? Second page, about a dozen lines down, there's a, par um, a line that starts with the word support. How are you doing on that? Needle in a haystack here. Keep going. So about three lines down. That's there, it. there you go. Oops. You passed. It. That's it. Yeah. Okay. It says support. It should say the previous plan, where it says the support the plan. The word previous should be before the word plan. Okay. And then on the next page, on the next page. In the paragraph that starts with the chair introduced, the next to the last line that says, the chair suggested a joint meeting with the Zoning Board of Appeals since that board two. I think we can just delete since that board two. So it would say with the Zoning Board of Appeals to discuss the ZBA's perspective. That's it. Those are my suggested edits. Great. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Ken, any modifications? Uh, yeah, on page two, um, somewhere near the top, probably like four or five sentences down, uh, is a quote that says, Mr. Laos uh, says that he feels moving the existing building forward would not activate the, street, the streetscape. The new development should. Not, not the new one is needed to suit Mass Ave. Anything else, Ken? Nope, that's it. Great, thank you. Uh, Melissa, any modifications? Nope, okay. Uh, Steve, any modifications? Uh, no modifications. Great, and I do not have any either. Uh, so is there a motion to approve, approve the meeting minutes from November 15th, 2021 as amended? So move. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> we'll call vote, starting with Ken. Yes. Ken? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Great. Uh, Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Meeting minutes from November 15th, 2021 have been approved as amended. So I will um, ask again to see if there is a, a member of the applicant team for docket number 3680, Citizens Bank of 629 Mass Ave with us yet. Tonight. Tracy Deal has arrived. 
Thanks. and is now present. Good evening. Hi, Tracy. Thanks for joining us tonight. So uh, we will now go ahead and uh, open docket number 3680, which is the application for um, new signage uh, for Citizens Bank at 699 Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, so Tracy, um, I would uh, like to give you uh, up to five minutes for a brief presentation of the application. Um, then we'll turn it over to uh, Jenny Rate from the Department of Planning and Community Development to speak to the memo that was prepared um, before we um, turn it over to the board for any questions we might have for you. So okay. You, you could um, yourself and take it away. Okay, good evening, uh, members of the board. Um, the changes that are proposed uh, for this particular location, we have uh, worked extensively with staff uh, to try to um, keep the changes to a very um, minimum. The, um, the biggest change that you're going to see is the addition of the awnings on the windows. Um, the Citizens, uh, Citizens Bank is proposing to um, put awnings on the windows at this location, as well as all of their other locations in the region. Um, this is something that they are proposing as part of their uh, rebranding that is taking place because uh, Citizens Bank is changing from Citizens Bank to just Citizens. So their name is being changed in all of their locations. So their signage is being upgraded at all of their locations. Uh, this is a uh, bank that is throughout the region in Massachusetts, as well as other um, states in the New England area. And the uh, proposal for the awnings on the windows is something that is consistent with most of their locations. Uh, the um, other signage that is being replaced is the uh, signage above the uh, drive-through elevation, um, and it's a removal and a replacement, as well as the signage on the side of the drive-through. It's a removal and a replacement, um, as well as refacing uh, the parking lot uh, informational signs and replacing a directional sign. Um, and uh, removing and replacing an awning over an entry door and adding a uh, custom mounted uh, citizens letter set above that awning and refacing the rooftop sign uh, with no alteration to the size, just a reface, um, which aesthetically would give it, you know, an updated look, get rid of the sun worn um, look and make it uh, cleaner and more crisp in appearance. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, the submission materials outline the changes and um, I'm here to elaborate if needed. Great, thank you very much, Tracy. I appreciate the presentation. Uh, Jenny, did you have any notes that you wanted to identify from the uh, memo that the department put together? I'm um, trying to finish scrolling through all of the signs mm -hmm. here <laughs> for the benefit of the public Sorry, and then I'll right. switch switch over to that screen one second. Um, so with, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is, you know, Tracy provided an overview. Um, there is an existing bank here. It's been in use for a very long time. Um, they're really only changing the signage. There is nothing else that is happening at this particular location of citizens um, in the community. And our main you know, issues with this particular application were simply um, the, you know, there's a, a large number of signs for one. Um, most of the signage is um, acceptable per our zoning bylaw and particularly our updated sign bylaw. Um, but we did uh, note uh, a couple of issues with some dimensional details for some of the signage and also uh, noted that a couple of them exceed the allowable sign uh, uh, requirements as noted in the zoning bylaw uh, for these particular sections, specifically the service island uh, canopy signs and the monument sign. Um, those were our main issues and 
we had tried to work with this applicant to see if there was a way to um, just have her uh, essentially switch out the existing signage rather than enlarge it in these couple of uh, locations, but um, they are requesting that this uh, be approved with the signs as seen on the plan. So that is why it is being brought to the board. Great, thank you for the uh, summary, Jenny, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Great, at this time, I'd like to open it up to the board for any questions to the applicant, and we will start with Ken. Jenny, can you flip over to the monument sign? Tracy, can you tell me which, which page it is on, please? Let me look up at the... The one on top of the building is still the same, right? That hasn't changed at all. It's the... Sorry, I was muted. Uh, it just takes a minute for me to scroll through. That's why I was checking to see if Tracy could give me the page number of that sign. Here you go. Okay. Well, this is, is this what you were looking for? This is just a directional sign. No. Okay. Um, Ken, is it the one on the building? The one on top of the building? Yeah, is that what you're looking for? No, that didn't increase in size at all, I don't think, uh, Melissa. Uh, can she unmute or can she? Yes. Tracy, which, which um, page in your plan, in your submittal has the monument sign? I don't have any monument signs other than what's on the rooftop, um, okay, unless so you're referring to the directional sign that's in the parking lot. And were you talking about the rooftop sign? Sorry, Rachel. Maybe you're right. I don't know. Uh, I only had one question and saying, is the actual box of the sign the sign or is the letters within that box the sign? For S9, which is on page seven, the monument um, directional sign is the whole size. The whole sign itself is 4.58 square feet. This illustration isn't really, isn't really um, exemplary of what you're going to see because this sign itself is just a very small directional sign. That's four and a half square feet in size. They're removing this bigger sign and replacing it with something that's small that's hidden by the fence. That one there, I have no problem with. The one you're showing right now, um, Jennifer, I, I think I'm, I must have been talking about the, my note was about the, the actual size of the letters on, on that, uh, on the billboard and, How's that? Is that counted? Is the actual square where it says four foot high by six foot three? That is that the sign, or is it the letters that's the sign that's over the um, what's permitted? On this, that's the whole face. The whole face is four foot high and six foot three inches wide. That's the whole dimensions of the face. Yes. But is that considered the sign or the letters is the sign? The letters within that face is the sign. Well, am I make, not making any sense here? The le the, well, the, I, that would be a question for code. I'm not exactly sure how the sign area is measured. Um, from what I can see in your code, sign area is measured by um, the whole face. So the sign area would be the height of the face times the width, not just the letters. 
Uh, Tracy, mm -hmm. when we, uh, could I just ask uh, Jennifer to answer that, please? Can you tell me which sign you're looking at specifically? Yeah, are you looking at right up right now? That, that one okay. there. This sign. Sorry. The, the size of the sign is the size of the whole sign. That includes the timing, the time, and all the little. The whole, the whole thing is the whole sign size that we're talking about. If you're talking about dimensions of the sign, so these dimensions are covering the entire, the dimensions of the sign. Is that correct, Tracy? Those dimensions cover the sign panel. They do not include the existing um, message center. I do not have those dimensions for the message, the existing time and temperature sign um, available to me. But that's all existing though. Yes. So all you're changing is that face that's four foot by six foot three. That is correct. So, so essentially this is, is considered grandfathered in then. Uh, I guess that's not the correct. Conforming. Right. So I guess that word is not uh, PC correct anymore. I was told not to use that right. word grandfather. Right. Um, it's uh, legal non-conforming, possibly. Yes. Correct. Okay. So, Kim, to your question, the, the, the one that you're speaking, if you're referring to Jenny's memo, it's the monument sign that's the directional that is above the allowable um, square, square footage when it's replacing the one that's currently up on two posts. No, yeah, no that, I wasn't referring to that one. I, okay. I'm a little confused. That one there is actually lowered. Uh, below the fence right. i'm I, i'm okay with that okay. um it's it's a little bigger but you know i'm not really gonna i was i was trying to figure out what this is so so if this whole thing is existing then it's all non-conforming i have nothing else to say on this okay thank you ken uh gene any questions or comments for tracy i do thank you um just a few tracy thank you for bringing this to us um, have you had a chance to look at the staff's memorandum about your proposal? I don't, um, if I have looked at it, it's been quite some time. I haven't looked at it today. Okay, so there are two places in the staff's memorandum where um, you had not provided dimensions. So it's hard for us to determine whether um, your proposal meets the dimensional requirements. And one of those is sign S17 and the other is S20. So I don't know if you can tell us now what the size of those would be. Size S17, the door vinyl. Yes. And S20, mm -hmm. I do not have those dimensions. Okay, but if Jody, if you can go back to 17 for a second, is is this the same size as the existing one? Is yes. A different type Yes, it is. Okay, let's go to S20 then. Okay, so and this is the ATM topper. Mm -hmm. And it's the same size as what's existing. Okay, thank you. That very helpful. Um, then um, the staff had, goes on to say that um, we don't have, or you didn't provide the mounting height dimensions and description of the mounting hardware for the proposed window awnings on signs one and 11. So do you have the mounting height I... dimensions and description? I thought that the um, the mounting descriptions were provided. I do have all of the mounting details for each um, window, but I'm not allowed to share my screen, so. Okay. Okay, no, I just. I thought that those dimensions were added to page three. Um, but I don't know if they were at, if you if they were added before or after this was submitted. There they are. So look at sign, okay. Jenny, does that meet what we need? I believe so, but I mean, Kelly has rejoined. Um, Kelly, do you wanna chime in here? Yeah, I can add, um, the concern was just wanting to know the 
the height, the base height that the awning will project out to, um, because that per the bylaw has to be a minimum of eight feet. So we have the height. Wow. Yeah, well, those windows are all, if you can see there's a gentleman standing in front of the building. Um, and those windows are already more than five feet above grade. And the awnings are all at the top of the window and they only extend down three feet. Those awnings are probably 10 to 12 feet above grade. Kelly, is that what we need? Um, yeah, it has to be a minimum of eight feet. Okay. So that, we will that comply with that, and I will make sure of that. It, and actually, uh, Gene, if you look at the, the, uh, the this elevation right here, there's mm -hmm. a door right there. Mm -hmm. That door is seven feet high. Okay, and then on um, S11, the dimensional details regarding the printing awning sign that's on here now? No. S11. Mm -hmm. And what is your question? It's asked for the dimensional details on S11. This is an existing awning and it's reskinning of an existing awning. The existing dimensions are not changing. They're using the existing frame and recovering it on the existing frame. And we don't have the dimensions. Um, the dimensions are up in the top left hand corner. They show that it's five foot seven inches wide, three foot seven inches um, in overall height at the back, and then that it's 48 inches deep. Okay, but it's basically just going over the exist, just changing yes. the existing one. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and then there are two, um, well, there are three. The proposed service island canopy signs exceed the allowed size in the bylaw for service canopy signage. And the proposed monument sign for directional signage exceeds the allowed area. So in order for us to approve something that exceeds signage, among other things, we need to determine that it's in the public interest to allow a larger sign based on the architecture of the building, the location of the building, the use of the building. So I'm having a hard time figuring out why allowing these larger signs would be in the public interest. And I wondered what your explanation would be or whether you'd be willing to reduce them to the required sign sizes. And which particular signs are you talking about? The service island canopy signs. S2 Is that S4? S2 and S4. S2 and S4. So those signs um, that are existing are, um, as you can see in the photographs, those existing signs, while um, they're there, they're not really legible. So the idea is that they can provide signage that is minimal, but legible. Um, so these, are, these letters are two foot um, in height and that's the maximum height with the citizens with the tallest letter um, being with the logo being two foot. And so that's where the square footage comes from because most of their letters are lowercase, but you're putting one box around the whole letter set and you have to be able to read the letters. Um, so Citizens Bank is, uh, they feel that this is the appropriate um, letter height for this, for this location. They feel that this is the appropriate size for legibility for their patrons to be able to see it in different weather conditions and traffic, um, when they're unfamiliar with the area, when they're traveling here, uh, because the sign that is already in place isn't really legible at the square footage that it's at. And so they tried to, um, they were actually proposing something bigger and we reduced it. Um, they tried and they were proposing to make that whole background green and we reduced that. 
And so they're just trying to do what they can to make sure that the sign is legible for motorists so that they can safely find the bank um, in all in all directions when they're traveling to here. So, so Jenny, can you go to S2, which is the sign over the canopy? That's it right there. And so S2 and S4 are proposed um, at the same size for aesthetics to make sure that the signs are matching in size on you know, both elevations. Um, the S4 is, uh, it faces the parking lot. And yeah, S2, I guess, S2 I guess faces I'm, the road. I, I guess I'm not, convinced that a sign that meets the um, allowed signage, which is 20 square feet, would be something that people couldn't read from the street. And if we measured it, putting a box around the logo and putting a box around the letters, it would be 20 square feet. The reason why we've got this 20, 26 square feet is because it's measured from the smallest rectangle method of putting a rectangle around the whole size of the sign. So the space above the ZENS and the space in between the citizens and the DAISY logo, all of that is captured in that sign area and that's what puts them over. Jenny, is that correct? And actually, Kelly, can you uh, jump sure. in for a moment? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I actually don't, I don't know for certain because the dimensions aren't provided of the ZENS. Um, we calculated out the area of the DAISY and then the separate area of the letters of citizens. And I believe we had like a minimum of 25.8 square feet and then a maximum for the rectangular area of 26.8 square feet. So I'm not sure, um, but I don't, I don't have the specific dimensions to know that it would actually be as low as 20. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't want to belabor this over a few feet, but I sort of feel like, you know, these regulations were put in, these bylaws were put in place for a reason, and our ability to um, alter it is limited when we can find it's in the public interest. And I'm, you know, so that's where I am in the moment, not really convinced. And the same thing with, um, the monument sign for directional signage. So um, we'll hear what my other colleagues have to say, but my general thought about this would be to um, send this to the staff and see if you and they can get to the correct signage because I'm signed with the signage because I don't think, at least as I read this, I would approve something in addition. Can I ask you, what is the maximum for that directional sign? The monument sign? Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be three square feet according to the staff. Yeah. I don't think that that would be a problem. We could definitely comply with the three square feet on that monument sign. So, um, uh, well, that's good. Then I Because we did another location in a nearby community where we had to comply with a, a size of, of that, a sign of that size and we were able to do it. Okay, so um, I think, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead, Tracy. No, that's okay. Um, but the letters, the letter set, when you start cutting the letters down smaller because of the delineation of the design, it starts to make them less and less legible. Um, so I'm not so sure, sure that we could bring those down much more. I don't know, it looks pretty big to me, but I, that's my thinking at the moment. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to see uh, what some other uh, board members have for their comments, starting with uh, Melissa. Okay. Um, 
Thank you for you know the presentation, Tracy. Um, in terms of the thinking for the number of signs on this site, um, I'm just curious. S four. I can understand like some of the illuminated signs facing the street, but the S four that's kind of facing the parking lot again it seems a little bit redundant to me, um, given the amount of signage throughout the kind of citizens campus there or parcel. Um, so I don't know, I would consider kind of, you know, if it fits, or is this one, remind me, is this one within the size or is this was one of the ones that we're talking about? This is one of the two that, one of the uh, three that, that goes goes outside, about. right. Yes. So uh, maybe one option would be to consider eliminating that one, um, just given the amount of signage you had. And then Tracy, could you help me um, just understand what Citizens Bank's approach to maintenance um, is with the awnings. I think one thing we notice over time is that they look good at the beginning and then they start to deteriorate, sun fade, and um, you know, kind of, I'd be concerned about just how the bank will be maintaining it. Mm -hmm. uh, these are made with this umbrella material. They're not supposed to um, have, uh, they're not supposed to deteriorate very quickly. They're rated for um, many years of use. Uh, citizens would be happy to comply with any uh, requirements to routinely maintain them uh, as the board would stipulate if you would um, like them to uh, routinely inspect them say every two years um, or every three years. I, I believe that they would be certainly happy to do that. Um, this That is actually not a question that I have experienced before, but I do know that they will um, that they will be happy to comply with any required maintenance. I also want to comment regarding S4. If you refer to the site plan on page two, you can see that the bank is on the eastern portion of the lot, and this is a drive up that's on the western portion of the lot. So the purpose of that sign is for the person that, say, enters from the rear and isn't exactly sure of where the drive up is or where they need to be. That sign in the parking lot says, hey, yeah, Citizens is over here, but we're also over here. Um, and that's, this is a unique layout uh, with a drive-through that's not attached to the building. And in most cases in the bank, in banks, you know, the drive-through is typically attached to the building. Um, so that is the purpose of that sign is from the people that are entering, say, from the rear of the par parking lot um, that they can say that they can tell that this is part of Citizens Bank. It's not a separate bank. It's not a separate location. It is part of their location. And that's why they have the branding there. OK, OK, that's helpful. Understanding the thinking process. Um, yeah, in terms of the maintenance, I think that would be, you know, something that I would look at I would look for mm -hmm. um, as well as kind of the brackets and any kind of rusting that kind of occurs over time. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Any other questions? Oh no, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Steve, any questions for Tracy? Um I there's I do have one which hasn't I uh, we haven't addressed yet. And I think I know the answer, but I just would like to be sure. There's a provision in the sign bylaw uh, about visibility and uh, the, the visibility on corners, and it essentially prohibits signs within a 20 foot trying 25 foot isosceles triangle at the corner. Um, it's section six two three a three, and I just. I think the front sign would be outside of that triangle, but I would just like to make sure. Um, are you making the request of the applicant to, as to whether or not they have reviewed that section of the, the bylaw? Either, either the applicant or, or staff. Okay. Tracy, I'll throw that over to you first. And I believe that's specific to, is that to the, um, the entry signage? Steve? Yes. Okay. And which sign, which sign is that that you're referring to? That one. S3? One of, uh, S11. S11. The one we're S11. Looking that S11 is on the wall? Mm-hmm. Um, that would not obstruct 
wall signage would not obstruct the um, site triangle. That was the question, correct? Yeah. You were asking yeah. about walls, about a signage yeah. that obstructs mm -hmm. the site triangle? Yes. Yeah, wall so signage would not obstruct the site triangle. S11 is located on the building um, over the entryway, and it is not um, on the corner of the lot. It is completely mm -hmm. out of the corner of the lot, and it's parallel to the wall, so it would not be obstructing. Mm -hmm. Unless the whole building was obstructing the site triangle, mm -hmm. that sign would not. Okay, that's fair enough. Yeah, and then signs... Um, S8 and S9, those are directional signs that um, are already in existence. And to my knowledge, there's been no traffic related incidents with those signs. Um, and S9, again, we had already uh, said that they would reduce that to meet the three square foot requirement. Mm -hmm. And S8 is a reface of an existing, which you can see through the bottom of that sign and around mm -hmm. that sign. So that shouldn't obstruct the view either. Okay. Uh, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. So Tracy, I just have one uh, question for you. Um, Jenny, if you could go to uh, sign S11, the um, sign over the main entrance. And I was just looking for a little bit more information on this, this light bar. So I'm assuming that these are illuminated letters. The um, I think you said it was the DAISY logo and the citizens itself. Does this gray bar also illuminate or is that the raceway for? That is a down lighting. It is a down lighting that casts down over. It washes over the top of the awning. It is not obtrusive or obstructive. It doesn't, um, it's basically designed to um, give a wash over the light so that, you know, if you were looking at this green material in the dark, it would be dark. Um, so the light, the light bar is designed to give a slight light wash over the top of the awning. Um, it's a very low uh, LED that just, um, it's very uh, dim and it just gives like a light wash. Like, but like if you turned your cell phone on and you like tried to light up an area with your cell phone, that's about how much light it would put up. It's not very much light. It's just designed to wash the co the cover of the awning with a light. Okay. And are the uh, is the citizen plate are those inter internally illuminated letters or are those these not letters? letters are dimensional letters? They are not illuminated. They are not illuminated. Okay. So my um, my only comment here, and again, um, I'd like you to explain the thinking, and it may have to do with the awning itself. It, it looks to me like the light bar, the width of that should match the, the width of the awning itself. Right now it sticks out behind it, but I'm not sure if that's because of the pitch of the, or the um, flare of the awning. Um, but if you could just explain that to, to me, just architecturally, it should, um, it should match the width of the window and the uh, awning itself there at, at, the, at the back. The light bar will match the width of the awning. This is just very bad artwork. Okay. <laughs> um, when you do these kinds of dimensional drawings, you're trying to create depth and you know, you're know you trying to recreate what's already there. And sometimes that's not easy to do. I will make mm -hmm. sure that they know that that light bar has to match the width of the awning. Great, that was my own. And I'll make sure that there's drawings that note that as well. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'll turn uh, once more over to um, the board for any questions before I open it up for public comment. We will have time to discuss um, before we uh, make any any ruling on this hearing. Uh, any other? It looks like Jean has another question. I just wondered to the staff: is is this building on the list of historic buildings in town? Kelly. Yes, it is on the local inventory, so we'll have to go before the historical commission for review. I mean, I think that's good um, because I will say I don't think we have the authority to say anything about the awnings in general, but I don't think they're the right look for this building, but I'll leave it to the historical commission to have that discussion with the applicant. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jean. And with that, um, 
I would like to, at this time, uh, open this up for uh, public comment. If there are any members of the public attending the hearing this evening who would like to um, offer any questions or comments to the applicant, please do so by using the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. I'll give a minute or two uh, to see if anyone has any interest in speaking on this, uh, on this docket number. All right, seeing none, we will uh, close public comment for the Citizens Bank signage. And I'll turn it back over to the board. Um, I will recap what, what I heard um, in terms of the items that we need to review together um, and any items we might want to refer back to the applicant for any further questions. Um, I uh, understand that the applicant is willing to reduce the size of the monument sign. Uh, Kelly, can you just confirm which sign number that is so that I can refer to that in the um, in the motion when we make that? Second, I'm just looking at the memo. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Take your time. Yeah. Um, sorry, at the long list. The um, yeah. sign S9. Thank you so much. Um, the applicant indicated the sign S11, which is the, um, the entry signage would match the width of the existing, um, the existing windows. And um, I think from what I heard, the point of discussion that we have is whether or not we would approve the uh, two signs that I believe it was S2 and S4, which are currently um, proposed at above the um, current allowable signage, um, uh, allowable signage for, for their locations on the building or whether or not um, we would grant any, any relief to the applicant. So um, Jean, I'll start with you. I know that you were the first one to, to bring those two signs up. Well, I thank the staff for bringing them to our attention. And I, I don't see anything that makes it in the public interest to allow a larger sign than is authorized by the bylaw. Um, so I think if the applicant would agree to reduce the sign to the size required, those two signs on the canopy, to the size required by the bylaw, I would be ready to approve this with the other changes that were discussed. Great, thanks, Jean. Uh, any other thoughts from, from other board members relative to the proposed signage size and Jean's uh, suggestion to request their reduction? Um, uh, go ahead, Ken, then I'll go to Steve. I would be okay with the one that's on uh, Mass Ave is have them delete uh, S4 and, and uh, say they will okay S2. I see their point in view of uh, making it legible from the street and needing a, a certain size so you can see it traveling on on, uh, on Mass Ave. But uh, I see less of that uh, from the parking lot for wayfinding because you're not driving very fast. You're at the destination already. So it's not like you're going somewhere else you, you, you're in the parking lot, you're, you're basically at the bank. So I can see uh, eliminating, I'd be okay with eliminating the sign on um, S4. And would that make uh, S2 meet um, the regulations then, uh, Jenny? Or? Uh, I believe that they're Kelly? both individually over the 20 square foot requirement. Or the yes. Requirement. It'll still be over, you're saying, uh, Rachel? Yes, Kelly, if you want to confirm. Yes, the, the maximum area is per sign. So it's 20 square feet per sign. Oh, per sign. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'd be okay with the saying, uh, uh, giving them some relief for the one on Mass Ave, but not the one uh, I, I would ask that there would be no sign on S4. That would be my opinion. Thank you. Jean, do you mind if I uh, get Steve's take first and then I'll come back to you? Great, Steve? Yeah, I, um, you know, looking at S, I, I thought about, I've thought about S2 and S4 a bit as well. Um, I mean, the one thing that I 
like about those signs is I think they're very well proportioned to the, um, you know, to the island roof themselves itself, uh, just in terms of the, you know, in terms of height. But I, you know, I take Mr. Benson's point, and I actually agree with, um, you know, um, Mr. Lau and Ms. Tentacolas. I, I think that S four is redundant. So my personal inclination would be to request the elimination of S four, uh, but grant relief with respect to S two. Great, thank you, Steve. Uh, oh, sorry, Dean. Let me just see if Melissa has any other thoughts, and then I'll I'll come back to you. Melissa, do you have any um, other thoughts on this particular topic? No, thank you. Okay, Jean. Sorry, I appreciate you bearing with me. I'll just um um mention to my colleagues that the sign on the side of the canopy replaces an existing sign on the canopy. And I'm personally not interested in our having something that tells them that they have to remove one sign that replaces an existing sign so that another sign can be larger than a sign allowed by the bylaw. I'd be more happy to allow them to keep both of the signs provided they each meets the size required by the bylaw. Madam Chair. Yes, Melissa. Question. Okay, so it's harder for me to visualize the difference between um, what's, you know, how much we're exceeding um, what is allowed by the bylaw. And we don't have a visual for that, do we? Are we talking 20%? I mean, I think I feel like I need to see some comparison. My initial reaction is that it's pretty insignificant, but I understand where, what Jean is saying in terms of you know, the intent for why we would be allowing it to be bigger. So I don't know, is there a way to just kind of see that? Is there a percentage? You know, so it's it's another six feet over the, over the the twenty feet. So you know, your what is that twenty twenty percent? You know, a little somewhere between twenty and twenty five percent um, for each one. For each one. And Madam Chair, may I ask Tracy another question? Sure, absolutely. Um, Tracy, um, I know you said you could accommodate and fit in the one, I think that was the monument sign to the three, and I lost track because we're talking about several different signs. These two, S4 and um, is it? S2. S2 and S4, um, could you just explain again, the 20% increase on the signage as you see it is mainly because it's mainly because the the way that the ordinance measures sign area is with a, a single rectangle. And so the DAISY logo is two feet tall. The C, the C in citizens is actually slightly smaller than that. And then the ITI are the same height as the C, but the ZENS has a bunch of dead space over it. Right. And so that's where the extra space comes in to play. In theory, the sign itself is probably just right about the 20 square feet, maybe 21 square feet if you took out all of the dead space. But, you know, that's really a moot point because how the ordinance measures signage is how you have to look at it as a board. Um, so I very seldom even bring that up. In this case, if we wanted to shave off six square feet with a sign of this size, you're talking about taking this down to possibly a 12 inch letter. And then that becomes less and less visible the more right. you shorten it, the less visible it becomes. Um, and then that becomes uh, difficult for motorists, especially being that there is a rooftop sign. And when we're driving, we're not driving up like this with our necks up. We're driving with our eyes and our field of vision to what it can see you know, within a certain plane along the roadway. The rooftop sign purpose that serves is for people that are coming from a greater distance, but the motorists, you know, not everybody is tech savvy, not everybody is GPS savvy, not everybody 
is familiar with the area, these are going to be at times people that are completely unfamiliar with your city traveling here looking for this bank. I'll, have, I'll give you an instance. I had an incident in Peabody where I was doing a board meeting. Um, the board, I was actually there in person. The applicant was behind on their taxes. I had to go and withdraw money to pay the taxes for the board for the board to hear the case. I had to find a bank where I could do that. I'm in a strange city and stressed, extremely stressed because my case is about to be tabled and I'm trying to find a bank so that I can very quickly withdraw $3,000 to pay somebody's delinquent taxes in a hurry. You know, there are situations like that that occur where people are transient, unfamiliar with their area, they're trying to find a bank, they're familiar with the citizen's brand, and they're looking for a sign. So the more you shrink down that sign, the less visible it becomes, the more confusion you have for the people that are trying to find this location. And that's really what they're trying to eliminate. Citizens Bank is concerned about the safety of their patrons and the citizens of your city as well. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Melissa, does that answer your question? And perhaps what I could do is offer, um, you know, for the board um, a, a way forward. I, I actually um, like the suggestion of um, offering relief on the Mass Ave facing sign if the applicant was interested in removing the, um, the additional sign. Um, I, I agree with Steve. I think that it is well proportioned um, to the sign band that's created on the, on the awning. Um, or and what I would suggest is perhaps we give the applicant the option of either reducing both signs to the allowable um, to the allowable square footage or removing one um, and approving the, the other sign um, at, the, um, at the larger square footage. So I'd like to see what the board thinks of um, that potential proposal. And I'll start with uh, Kim. Fine with that. Jean? I was, I was looking at the existing sign compared to the proposed sign just trying to look at the height of the letters. And Tracy, you might be able to help with this. It looks like on the existing sign, the height of the letters is not as tall as on the proposed sign, is that correct? That is correct. And that existing sign's been up there for probably decades. And I don't think people are getting lost finding the bank. So I not convinced, sorry. So you wouldn't be in favor of offering an option, you would just want them both to be um, removed. Okay, uh, Steve, your thoughts? Uh, I'm okay with either option. Um, uh, my, I agree with Mr. Lau. Okay, Melissa? I'm okay with either option. Um, I just, I also had, <laughs> I don't wanna belabor it either, but I do for, um, I think for our board to consider, I, my understanding is these illuminated box signs are kind of, you know, we're moving away from those illuminated box signs and to are these more articulated signage. And so I think that's a positive. So um, just, you know, reinforcing that. And I don't know if we've talked about that as much with the sign bylaw here. Um, as far, you know, in my history here, I have not talked about that, but I think that's important to keep thinking about um, as how the technology's evolved. And then um, with regard to um, Madam Chair's proposal, I support either or. Great, so I believe that that's um, four, four of us here on the, on the board who would um, give the, propose giving the, the applicant the option of, um, either reducing the, the both signs or eliminating one and, um, and uh, keeping the other sign. If that motion is the motion that, that passes, Tracy, do you have a, a preference um, on behalf of, the, of Citizens Bank as to which you would uh, be comfortable moving forward with? Um. I think that they would be 
preferential to having the larger sign on the Mass Avenue size and foregoing the sign on the side. My question for you is, is that after this board, would we have to go to another board to get a variance for that? You would, you would not, but you, okay. you, still, you still would need to have, actually, I don't believe that the drive through canopy historic would have any jurisdiction over, correct? Uh, Kelly and Jenny, would they just be reviewing the specific, the building itself and not the drive through canopy? I would consider anything to be part of the property to be okay. what they would end up reviewing. It is all on Mass Ave, so it is all relevant to the subject parcel. Right. So you still, whatever we recommend still would need to be then further approved by the um, Towns Historic Commission. And if this board recommends approving one sign on the Mass Avenue side, and then I go back to citizens and they say, well, we would rather have two signs that comply with the code. Do they still have that option? We could make, we could build that into the motion that okay. um, we would approve um, either, either option. Okay. And, uh, give you the opportunity to work that through with the staff and with the okay. historic commission. Okay. So I think that would be fair enough. Thank you. The board approves going forward. Okay. Thank you. Great. So um, at this time, is there a motion to um, approve the, the signage as submitted with the following changes to reduce the um, size of the signage for, um, I've lost this in my notes, um, S. I apologize, this is the monument sign. That's S9, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for S9 to conform with the requirements um, in the bylaws to um, reduce the size of the light bar to match the width of the awning in sign S11 and to either um, reduce the size of the signs of S2 and S4 to, to conform with the um, with the size requirements of the bylaw or to eliminate the uh, sign facing the, the parking lot um, in order to uh, receive approval for the um, sign as submitted on the uh, sign on the uh, sign facing Mass Ave. And I believe that's is it S2 facing Mass Ave and S4 that is facing the parking lot. Is there a motion? So motioned. Is there a second? Second. All right, we'll take a roll call vote. For before I do so, are there any other uh, modifications to that motion? Okay, we'll take a roll call vote, starting with Kim. Yes. Dean. No. Steve. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Um. Sorry. <laughs> Out of order, but um, Rachel, what about the condition about maintenance? Does that have to be in at this point? I apologize that. So let us um, let us re uh, let me add back to the motion, and then we will um, retake the the vote. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, so uh, I will add to the motion the requirement to routinely maintain the awnings. Um, for um, to routinely maintain the awnings um, every uh, two years, as suggested by the, the applicant. Uh, is there a motion with the addition? So motion with the additional um, comment. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All right. Now we'll take the vote. Uh, Ken? Yes. Dean? No. Steve? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So uh, the uh, signage application has been approved. Thank you very much, Tracy. Thank you. you. The department. My apologies to the, mem to the members of the board for being late. My, my sincere apologies. I don't wanna disrespect your time ever. So I am sincerely sorry. It's okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for, um, for walking us through the applications. Much appreciated. Thank you. Have a good evening. All right, that closes agenda item number one. And we now move to agenda item number two, which is the uh, continued uh, preliminary discussion of zoning amendments. And I will turn it over to Jenny. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so this is a 
this is a longer discussion. We have, um, as a result of the board's interest in having people attend our meetings and discuss their ideas with the board before actually filing um, warrant articles, we have had a number of people inquire and ask to attend. And so the people who are on this list on the screen um, are all in attendance and ready to speak with the board about their ideas. They have shared their ideas with me, um, which I might, if they request, uh, will project them uh, sh and sharing my screen. Um, but I think that for now, they may just want to talk through their idea and uh, speak with the board about uh, any concerns or other suggestions as you've done with prior individuals um, attending these meetings to discuss proposed uh, zoning warrant articles. And then at the end, um, I would like a little bit of time to talk about my memo provided to the board, but I'll, I'll go last. So uh, you've got a list of people here and everybody is in attendance and Annie Laporte and Laura Wiener are first. Great, thank you. And I'll just um, note for, for everyone who's joining us that what I'd like to do is um, take each of these um, take each of these proposed articles individually. We'll have a short discussion, questions from the board um, before moving on to each of to each separate item. Um, if there are any uh, public comments related to these proposed articles, again, this is just the first preliminary discussion with the board. I'd like to suggest that any public discussion happens during the open forum. Um, so that we can uh, again move move through these here, and um, again we'll we'll have some short a short period after each for questions from the from the board members. Um, so we'll start first with the proposed article for two family housing from Annie Lacourt and uh, Laura Wiener. Um, good evening. Can you hear me? Okay. We can. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so I'll start, and then I think Laura will join in with anything that she feels that I have missed. Um, so the proposal that we are offering is pretty simple, and I have sent to Jenny both the draft article language and the draft main motion, and she's made some uh, edits, which I immediately accepted because they were really good. So all that we are proposing is that we change the zoning in the R0 and R1 districts to allow the construction of two family buildings by right. And my thinking on this article is um, twofold. Uh, the first is that um, allowing two family by right um, will increase housing production in general. I believe it's compatible with the draft housing plan, production plan that we are looking at. And that as a um, uh, uh, because it will allow for smaller sort of what I think of as missing middle home construction. So for example, uh, there's a house across the street from me that's just gone up, that's 2,800 square feet. If that was a two family, it would be 14 or 1,500 square feet per unit for um, those uh, two units, um, which I believe is a, a pretty adequate starter home or small family home for, um, folks. There's a house down the street from me that sold for $1.2 million recently that I think is under 2,000 square feet. Um, I assume that the house that is under construction is going to go on the market for something like 1.5 to 1.6. Even if um, the two family units could have been struck, constructed went on the market for eight dollars to $900,000, they would be more affordable than any other um, construction that we're seeing in our neighborhood. So uh, it helps us with housing production. It helps us regionally as well as in Arlington to make Arlington a more affordable place for young families and to get some pressure off the housing market generally. It doesn't produce what I would call capital A affordable housing. It produces what I would call naturally, um, uh, naturally affordable housing that is naturally more affordable than single family construction. So that's what's in my head and I look forward to hearing from the board um, about their ideas concerning that. And then Laura, if you have anything to add. Yeah, um, I'll just add um, that one of the things that appealed to Annie and I about this proposal was that it, um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it increases units without adding physical density. It doesn't change the setbacks or the heights. 
um, or parking or really any of the things that that neighbors perceive on um, in their neighborhood, um, but does allow more housing to be added. Um, it, it, and I think really the neighborhood will still feel the same. Um, also, it's well, it's it's a very simple proposal and will be easy to understand, but it's not, we're not the first people to consider doing this. Um, Cambridge has done something similar. California, the entire state has enabled that to happen. And um, Minneapolis also now has no single family zones within it. So uh, um, it's, a, it's an idea that is being considered in many places and perhaps it's time has come. Thank you both, I appreciate you. Uh bringing this forward. So um, we'll go ahead and start with uh, Jean. Uh, sorry, yeah, go ahead with Jean uh, with any questions uh, or um, comments for Annie and Laura. Jean, sorry, you're on mute. Sorry, I mean, overall, I'm not opposed to this. I have a couple of questions. Um, related to um, accessory buildings and other structures. Whereas when you have a two family, theoretically you could have twice as many. I just wondered if you'd given any thought to, to that, you know, like detached garages or sheds or things like that. Um, I have not. Um, I believe that the ADU article would cover most of what would make sense in an accessory building or, or like top of a garage or in, in replacement of a garage. So I think those things are already covered. I was thinking of straight up two family, um, just more families, less space per unit in some of the large homes we're seeing constructed in our neighborhoods. But otherwise, yeah. as you said, they'd need to meet all the dimensional parking and other requirements that exist currently in those two zones. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank you, Jean. Uh, yeah, um, this is a very interesting proposal. This was wasn't this, didn't we have one of these proposals like maybe two years ago? We did. Uh, and um, I like to think back and see uh, what, what were some of the questions that were raised then th that would be different now. Um, mm -hmm. at, that, at that point in time, I, I believe we, we chose not to support it. Uh, at that time saying to eliminate single family residents and make all single family residents two family. And there was a reason that we chose not to support it. Uh, Rachel and Jean, you two are around that time, right? Uh, okay. I, don't recall, I, I don't recall what were some of the reasons behind it. I, I have a vague recollection that the applicants chose not to go forward, but I may be misremembering that. That was how I remembered it as well, Ken, that um, it was withdrawn, but I, I, um, it, I, I, it also may have been the, um, right before the, the town meeting um, in 2020, if it was two years ago, um, which was the, the town meeting that was significantly scaled back. So Jenny, I don't know if you have any recollection of that particular prior, similar recommendation and the timing for that. I do remember. Um, and it was, um, it's, in a, it's in one of your reports to town meeting, which I'm not gonna go through the exercise of trying to pull that up, but um, I believe the board had a, actually a slightly divided vote on that from what I recall. And uh, the, that a lot of feedback was provided to the proponents at the time. And there was a recommendation for further study to be conducted, which I think at that time, we, even though we agreed, that was 
very challenging to do since there was not there there are not many bylaws that have this specific you know uh, requirement or change or modification. Um, that was what was requested at the time. I believe that that was 2020, the fall of 2020. Right. Um, special town meeting. I couldn't be here the evening that you voted. So this is my recollection of what I read in the report um, and the discussion that was um, had. I see Gene waving his hand. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add my, I, I'm starting to get some recall of this. <laughs> that the, um, the applicants put together a package that showed us many currently one family districts where there are two family homes currently located. Um, because they were built, you know, either before zoning or before that zoning for that area. So, um, um, yeah, I'll just point that out that this isn't starting to put two family homes in one family districts as if they never existed and don't exist now in Arlington. Great. Thank you, Jean. Yeah. Ken, did you have any other questions? No, I'm just want to get a little past history because I'm kind of on the fence of this one right now uh, just because people who bought homes in a single family area bought it for a reason because they want to be in that kind of single family area not in a um, uh, two family neighborhood um, so that's but you know I, I mean I guess I I can support it as far as let's let, let the town decide what they want to do, as opposed to us on the board this, uh, deciding that kind of stuff, you know, which would, not, would happen anyways. But I'm just on the fence right now. Thank you. Can I, uh, can I speak to that, Rachel, or is that not? Well, I just wanted to see if you had a specific question to to that again so annie what i'd love to do is maybe get some of the comments from the other board members and then give you all a chance to make any final comments of, again i'm just trying to to move us along if that's okay with you um steve um yes so in in disclosure um miss you know members who said that this sounds familiar is correct i presented this very same idea to the board two years ago uh there was a divided vote and you know, like, you know, I haven't got, I have not reviewed my notes from that hearing, you know, prior to tonight, but, um, you know, I, I think there was, uh, there were a number of, at least some desire to attach performance standards to, um, you know, to two family or duplex dwellings built in a single family zone, like you know, electric charging stations, or there, there were a whole bunch of ideas. Um, I actually, favor the the simpler approach um but you know one of the things that things that have happened in the last um two years one is you know yes more municipalities and and even states have adopted this sort of thing um you know oregon is an example i don't that i don't think was was mentioned earlier the other has just been you know, this is partially driven by the pandemic, but there has been a rapid increase in home values and therefore home prices in just the last two years. So in terms of the, you know, the cost impact of a regional, of, of, a, re, of a regional housing shortage or decades of underbuilding, if you want to put it that way, I, I think is hitting us a little harder than it was, um, you know, back in 2020. Great. Thank you, Steve. Melissa, thoughts? Um, well, thank you to Annie and Laura for bringing it forward. Um, I think it's, you know, in terms of housing, it's a progressive approach. And I think it's something that, you know, obviously consider a little bit more. Um, I'm curious if you guys have talked to some real estate professionals, because I fear, I'm wondering, my initial reaction is, you know, residents, thinking that the houses, kind of like what Ken said, like the houses that they bought into will be torn down. And, um, you know, kind of, even though we think we're kind of creating more stock and more options, you know, are the land economics such that, you know, 
I haven't, you know, given this kind of a fiscal analysis, but where, you know, where does that stand based on some, you know, residential real estate analysis to that, you know, what's the likelihood of a teardown? What is the land, you know, cost? Um, and I'm assuming I didn't hear all the details, but you're saying the footprint remains the same. Is that right? Right. Um, and then I think one thing to think about would be the parking because the, you know, the two family, um, imagining two families on the same lot, the cars tend to double. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm imagining that would be just something that, you know, neighborhoods would kind of start to, or neighbors would start to kind of question at least. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how far along some of the comparable um, places that you mentioned. I have you know read about that. I think that's great that we're pulling in some trends um, that are progressive and are trying to address the problems. Mm -hmm. um, it would be interesting to know what's happened, how things have progressed in those areas too. Great, thank you, Melissa. And uh, Melissa actually just hit on the two items that I was going to mention from my recollection of the. The prior discussion as well, which when the public weighed in, I think most of their concerns were about um, preservation of existing home value and understanding what that meant for, you know, again, their property that they had purchased in for and the question of, of parking um, requirements as well in their, in their neighborhoods. So um, just wanting to be sensitive to what we know had been um, some of the public questions prior. Um, so Annie and, and Laura, before we Move. Oh, I see Jean has one more question or comment before I open it up to you, you know, for any, any last thoughts before we move on. Sorry, I'm dredging things back from my memory. One of the things I had asked about last time <laughs> was whether there could be a requirement about what the houses would look like. And since then, the town's come out with the residential design guidelines. And I wonder if Annie and Laura would take a look at those and see if there's something that they would want to mandate or not for the two families that would get built in the single family zones, um, just so we don't end up with weird, unacceptable. Look, I'm not sure that's a good idea or not. I'm just suggesting to take a look at them and to see whether you think it would make sense to make them mandatory just for the two families in the single family zones. Just a thought. Great, thank you, Jean. So Amy and Laura, any, any thoughts now that you've heard the initial, initial feedback from the board? Well, I have thoughts, but maybe Laura, you wanna go first? Well, I guess one thing I wanted to say to Melissa is um, the foot, I would not say that the footprint has to stay the same. I think that the set there, it has to meet the setback requirements and, um, height and all requirements, but that's not the same as the footprint would remain the same. I mean, I think when there are tear downs now, the footprint does not remain the same and, and it, that could happen. But um, I, I agree that we should probably look at what some of the impacts are. I mean, I think it's pretty mm -hmm. new, um, but there are some places that have adopted it and, and it would be uh, mm -hmm. more than just interesting, but, but critical to find out if, it, if how how it's going there now and and we haven't done that and, and I'm happy to do that. Okay. I think a field trip is in order, don't you? Yeah. I got family in Minneapolis. Yeah. Happy to <laughs> go any old time. <laughs> um uh, so so I would add a couple of thoughts. First, Kim, what I would say to what you're saying is that you know, I live on, in a 15, 1600 square foot house on a 5,000 square foot lot. When we put the addition on this house, okay, it made it the largest house in the neighborhood. So my neighborhood is not the neighborhood I moved into. It's not the kind of neighborhood I thought I was moving to when I bought my house. And I don't get to control that because our single family allowed footprint allows people to build houses twice the size of my house on 6,000 square foot lots across the street from me. So I'm not sure that um, uh, people are under the impression that they have that much control over how their neighborhood develops. And certainly within walking distance of my house, the neighborhood has entirely transformed in the last 30 years. 
Um, but all of it is single family development. So it is typical in my neighborhood that when a small house sells, the house down the street from me that just showed, sold for $1.2 million has a very large lot that is only a third used by the house that's standing on it. That house is gonna get knocked down and a very large home is gonna be built there. But it's not gonna be a two family home. It's gonna be a one family home. And I would say that the other thing that has changed since 2000 is that a 1500 square foot house in my neighborhood in 2020 was worth seven or $800,000. And now it's worth north of a million. So you can't buy a single family home for what you could buy a single family home for two years ago. And so for young families trying to move into Arlington, that doesn't leave them a whole lot of options. And we're trying to create those options. Um, I think the parking issue is a question. I believe that our current zoning limits where and how much driveway you can have, and that would limit how many cars you could park. Um, I could be wrong about that, and maybe we should look at that, Laura, technically, just to see whether I'm wrong about that. Um, so I think that the, uh, the purchasers would just have to know how many cars they could park. Um, we did have one discussion with a developer whose response to the idea of whether or not developers would build two families if they were allowed to was, of course they would, they can make more money. Um, and I'd be really excited about the idea of applying performance standards if we could do it in a way that made sense to town meeting. My concern is that if we put forward very complex changes to the zoning bylaw, in general, town meeting will vote them down, not because they don't agree with what's being attempted, but because they don't understand whether or not complex changes actually are gonna have the effect that the proponents say they will have, as opposed to the effects that the opponents say they will have. So if we had a simple way to do that, something like if you are going to add to the property one of these five things, then we'll allow you to build a two family. Um, I'd be really interested in looking at that. Um, and then I, I, I don't know much about this technically, but I'm told that um, something like an overlay district might be the alternative to that. And I just don't know whether or not we can get our act together for that right now. So, um, and I could be misusing the term. Um, so those are my thoughts. Ken. And yeah, maybe maybe one more comment, and then um, we are going to need to um, move on to the, the next. Yeah, um, uh, maybe uh, my comment was a little misinterpreted, Annie. Okay, uh, I I didn't mean um, what what I'm what I'm looking for is, and maybe I'm wrong, but ten, typically single family houses, uh, families buy those. So if I look in my neighborhood. Do all single family houses. I live in a little small ranch and it's all families up and down the street. Uh, you know, as they grow, they either increase the size of the house or they move out and another family comes in. Uh, but I think if you start introducing two families, now the, uh, the family neighborhood of that neighborhood now may uh, develop in a different fashion. That's the thing I was looking at. And it may be, uh, and I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying that people who bought in thinking that that neighborhood is a family neighborhood now also is not, doesn't have the, uh, that same kind of quality of feel. That's the only thing I, I, I'm not sure how that is going to develop. And, you know, in, in a two family neighborhood, it's, it's a little different. Uh, where, where I was before I was married and had kids, I lived in a two family house, and, but it was a bunch of guys. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't kind of like a family, but that just from my experience, I'm not sure how it is elsewhere. And I just, I, I just think we have to look at that a little bit, that's all. It's a comment, that's Great. all. Got it. All right, well, thank you, Annie and Laura. I really appreciate you bringing this forward. I hope that the feedback was helpful and um, we look forward to um, seeing as this develops further. All right, um, so the next, uh, the next 
a person that has a an article, proposed article that will be uh, speaking this evening is um, another article on uh, starter homes. And this one is uh, from Barbara Thornton. So Barbara. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm mindful that there is a game on, so I'm going to go through as quickly as possible. Uh, we are, yeah, Ken, do I get your vote for that? Um, mm -hmm. uh, we are, I'm going to uh, just try and summarize quickly because I've sent a summary already to, to the board about what we're proposing. I'm calling this starter homes um, and and as we know in Arlington, uh, land use values have gone way up. A lot of people want to live here, but the current zoning that we have now encourages the building of McMansions and not starter homes. And by homes, I, I mean, when, when I'm speaking of two families, I'm thinking primarily of a two family house that's like a condo where each family, each of the units has an owner that has an opportunity to build equity. And we can't have people that aren't already millionaires coming into town and having the opportunity to be family and build equity and live in our town if we don't start building uh, more diverse kinds of housing. So we wanna make more housing available. We wanna make more diverse kind of housing available. Uh, the proposal, the starter home proposal affects all the residential zones, and it uses a process of rethinking our dimensional requirements and our FA requirement, uh, FAR requirements uh, in order to do that. Uh, we are delighted to see as, as we move forward thinking about this idea that the uh, housing plan came out uh, uh, just a few days ago. And I just wanna highlight a couple of things that reinforce why I think this issue is so important. If we are in fact going to uh, follow the recommendations of the housing production plan, uh, starting around page uh, 60 and thereafter, uh, one section says over 60% of the town falls within its lowest density residential districts, R0 and R1 with minimum lot sizes of 9,000 and 6,000 square feet respectively, respectively. In both districts, the only economic use permitted by the town is a detached single family dwelling. And then in another section on, in, in that same uh, report, it says, uh, local zoning does not allow for enough diversity of housing types. Residential buildings containing more than two units generally require a special permit to be developed. This adds time, cost, and uncertainty to the permitting process and also makes permit approvals more vulnerable to unwarranted appeals. So we want to do what we can with a warrant article that will encourage the, the private market to develop more housing. All our housing is going to turn over. I mean, we're not going to live forever and the housing that makes it feel like the neighborhood today is really getting old fast and it's going to have to be rebuilt. And if we don't change the zoning, it's going to be rebuilt to maximize the current uh, zoning opportunities or, the, or, or what's allowed to be built. And we would rather have the developer come in and build two 2000 square foot buildings for homes than we would have them come in and build one 4,000 plus square foot for homes. And that's pretty much the, the position that we're taking. Um, I'd, I'd like to know, that's that's a kind of the general summary of, of where we are. I would really like to know in our conversation uh, later, what the what you, the ARB members, would, would like to see us do as uh, we, and I'm sp speaking the, the royal we here, including Annie and Laura and others, uh, that are out there thinking about writing these warrant articles, uh, would you prefer to just hear our ideas and then you write them? Or would you uh, like us to continue to flesh out the ideas, for example, the ideas that, that we're on track with now with the starter home proposal? Or uh, would you like to propose an additional different uh, adjustment in the direction that I've proposed tonight for the starter homes, for example? Great question. Thank it. you so much, Barbara. Uh, we'll start with Kim. Well, my opinion is, I think 
I would encourage you to continue doing what you're doing because I think it's a good collaborative way of doing things and gets more people involved from the town on what they want. Uh, Thank you. I think having a more diverse housing and, and more uh, also more economic housing is great. And I think one of the things we're lacking is um, uh, aging in place housing besides just starter homes. And, uh, things that I've, I'm just giving you my opinion, that's okay. Don't think it's not, it's not that uh, there's not enough housing where there's elevators and there's not enough. So when you get a little older, I'm looking toward that soon. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, there's no place for you for you to go. That you know, that you want to stay this stay in this neighborhood. I mean, you know, we all love Arlington. We want to stay here, but you know, I know I'm not going to be able to manage uh, keeping up the house and having multi floor living. And it'd be nice if there was an option. And I don't think there's an, there's enough of an emphasis put on that right now. And then also. I think what you said, Bob, is right on. Starter home. Um, there's not enough where someone who, uh, who just just graduated college that grew up in the neighborhood and wants to stay in the neighborhood can stay here. They're priced out of the market. There's no way of uh, building equity. Um, so I think having maybe something like that, and you know, in the I don't know, maybe a mixed use housing complex where there's integrated and diverse uh, living together may, may be a good choice. Or maybe that's only one option. There might be other options, but I think to answer your earlier question, I think I encourage you guys to stay involved because then you bring in a different attitude, a different, different view. And I think it's good. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Ken. Much appreciated. Gene? Um, yeah, thank you, Barbara, for bringing this forward. And in the spirit of full disclosure, a few other people and I have been working with Barbara on this. Um, so I, you know, I'd say we're, I'm doing it because I think it's a good idea to try to figure out how to get homes built that aren't as big as the homes are that are getting built now so we can maintain some of the quote unquote missing middle houses and to do so in a way that hopefully by doing enough of it might help with um, economic and racial and ethnic diversity in the town. I mean, we're not going to get to, you know, very inexpensive houses just because the land is so expensive in town. But if we can sort of knock down the price of some of the houses by doing some things with the zoning code, I think that would be helpful. And, and part of the impetus for this came with something that Barbara thought of a couple of years ago, but didn't bring forward was, can the town do something with, with currently non-conforming lots? They might be too small or they might lack adequate frontage. And maybe though that's one place where we can think about um, allowing smaller homes. So. That's a little bit of the thinking. And other than that, I'm interested to hear what other members of the board have to say and then what the public has to say there in the open forum. Thanks. Great, thank you, Jean. Melissa? Um, thanks. Thanks, Barbara. Um, I don't have too much to add at this point. I mean, I think, you know, again, creative ways to create some options um, in terms of size. Um, you know, I do feel like I'm a little bit more cynical because I think there's larger market forces and that, you know, one community cannot solve a lot of the affordable housing. I think we can do what we can to make adjustments within our housing stock. And I think that's, you know, what we're trying to do before we did that, um, your work through the accessory dwelling units and exploring this as an option, I think is in the right direction. Um, but, you know, this is, you know, a larger 
obviously social kind of condition of almost where we're at, you know, as a nation with housing and affordability. So just to, you know, keep that in mind, Arlington alone cannot do that. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, Steve. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Thornton, for the presentation. Um, I'd encourage you to keep working, uh, keep refining your ideas and keep working on it. In terms of, you know, possibly some specific suggestions, um, perhaps looking at either townhomes or single family attached, uh, just uh, as, yeah, just uh, as, as a few Sorry. people have noted, land here is expensive and you know, whatever, I think whatever you could do to amortize the cost of land will help. Um, you know, I, I want to, but I want to be really straightforward because most of Arlington's parcels are developed. Um, you know, this is going to be a series of incremental steps that take place very gradually over time. Um, we are a redeveloping community. I think. I, I think. I, I think the the housing product, the draft housing production plan, referred to us in, in that context. A, a community that's in the middle of redevelopment. Um, but you know, I I'm fully supportive of the idea to have, um, you know, smaller units that cost correspondingly less than, you know, the large new construction we're seeing today. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, and I, I would just add that I, I agree that I, I think um, I'm, I'm really interested to see where this continues of evolving to. And I think to some of the points that Steve just made, um, and I would say that this is both for you as well as for Danny and Laura as well. One of the things that's important, I think, for uh, not only the board, but more importantly, the public and the town meeting members to understand is what the um, what the impact is potentially incrementally, because I think that um, understanding how how long it takes in some cases and and how gradually the you know it, it is an impact, but it's it's not like floodgates open you know usually, and um, you know the entire character of the town changes overnight. I think, um, you know, under looking a little bit that validating some of those, you know, making some projections based on, you know, again, talking with developers, those in the real estate community, et cetera, is, is really important because I um, saw how impactful that was in terms of creating that understanding when you and, and your, um, your, your colleagues looked at the ADU article as an example. So that's just an area that I encourage Take both of you to take a look at. Barbara, any any further questions or or thoughts for the board at this time? I uh, know. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. The next uh, person who will be speaking to us this evening is um, David uh, Pretzer, uh, which is a proposed article for the floor to area ratios in uh, business zoning districts. Uh, hello, uh, thanks for uh, g giving me time. Um, something I, I've noticed uh, recently is that while um, you know, we've said that we're allowing mixed use development in the business districts um, and like in, in the, in the uh, you know, sort of in the bylaw, we said that they can be as much as four or five stories tall. Um, it seems that in practice, it's hard to build something that tall in our existing districts because of the floor area ratio uh, limitations, um, which is often just like 1.5. So you're not gonna be able to get the four or five stories with an FAR of 1.5, unless you've got a very large yard or parking area, which isn't practical on a lot of our business districts where the parcels are pretty small um, and already often covered with like one story buildings. Um, and so I think there'd be a lot of advantages to increasing the floor area ratio um, in these parcels, um, so we're allowing for more mixed use development, which could um, potentially provide both like the capital A affordable units via our inclusionary zoning, and also more generally allow us to have more, either more housing along public transit corridors where um, people could take advantage of those opportunities and provide more uh, customers to patronize local businesses or potentially um, for other mixed use could provide 
um, other you know, more effective use of this you know accessible space in Arlington. So um, you know, my, I'm I'm still you know working out the details, but my like current thought is to maybe uh, double the existing floor area ratio uh, um, limitation for the B2 through B5 um, districts. So that would take something where the FAR is currently 1.5 and make that three, um, which would make it comparable to some of the existing uh, buildings that are along Mass Ave that were built prior to the current um, FAR limitations. Um, and I, I think those buildings are great and sort of more buildings of that form is something we should encourage in areas that are currently you know, just one story buildings. Um, yeah, that's my concept. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Uh, we will uh, now take a couple of questions and uh, comments from the board members, starting with Jean. You know, the board itself, thank you very much, Sadie. The board itself has discussed this in the past and has said, look, we need to do something with the floor area ratios in the business district. So um, I think this is a really good idea. I think, you know, you can look all up and down the town and find so many reasons why this is necessary. One of the more interesting ones is the, the buildings with the Capitol Theater on it, which everyone loves and thinks is terrific. And it couldn't be built today because it exceeds the current floor area ratio there. And you can find lots of other examples um, up and down Mass Ave. So I think this is really needed. I think what we need to sort of figure out is where, what type of buildings and what should the FAR be in those areas. And um, I think that's going to be the lead's challenge in, in you know, what he brings back to us. And he might need to talk to the planning and community development staff, including the economic development folks about what seems reasonable as, and, um, you know, get an idea about how to put this together and what the right FARs should be. You know, he suggested doubling them. That may make sense in some places, maybe in some places it should be more than doubling because they seem to be a weird amalgam of numbers right now. But I definitely encourage him to go forward with this. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Ken? I echo Jean's uh, uh, comments. Uh, it's something that we've always talked about, never got around to do. Uh, I think what you're trying to do is, is um, spot on, uh, you know, and doubling it may be uh, not aggressive enough in some areas. And so I think uh, you can have to do a, a sort of like a mini study uh, along the, the business corridor and see what's right. Um, you know, um, I, I don't think um, you're going to have to look at it in a certain ways where as you go up and down Mass Ave, it's not a one concurrent corridor. I, I like to look at Mass Ave and say there's nodes within that uh, corridor there that can, be, that can be built up and there's other areas to, that naturally have open space has, has um, more community space and other things. So it's not gonna be that, uh, to put uh, words to some of our other uh, people that I've heard, this canyon along Mass Ave. It won't be that because it won't develop that way. And um, I highly encourage you with that. And if you need any help, I will offer whatever I can to help you with this. I think um, I'm very interested in this. Uh, personally, and I'm not sure, I'm not going to speak for the board, but I think you know, we, we encourage you to, uh, to move forward with this. I think this is really important. Uh, yeah, th thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm new to being a town meeting member and I'm still figuring out a lot of stuff. So I definitely appreciate any help you're able to give in sort of figuring out sort of what the right parameters are for this, for this warrant article. Um, I think going through Jenny, is, am I, am I, Putting you on the spot there, Jenny. 
uh, is to go, go through Jenny and that's the way to go. Uh, she's a great resource and, uh, and, you know, I will help you as best I can, but start off going through Jenny. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Melissa, any uh, thoughts or comments? Um, thoughts, I mean, I think it aligns with what the ARB has been, you know, talking about as its goals. Um, it also aligns with the master plan that's um, outlined in kind of reconsideration of how we are better supporting kind of our main streets, mixed uses, and enabling that. So thank you for moving this forward. Um, in terms of working through details, yes, with staff. Have you done that um, yet to date? I wasn't sure because I know some have already worked with it sounds like with some folks. Yeah, I, 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 I only proposed this like a week ago. And so um, I, I did talk to Jennifer Raid and she's like, well, I think the first step will be bringing it to this meeting. So it, it worked out there, but I, I'm definitely uh, excited to develop it further um, as, uh, yeah, as we get closer to town meeting. Okay, great. Well, thank you for your efforts on putting it forward. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Steve. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, like my other colleagues on the board, I am also supportive. Um, and I think Mr. Pretzer, you know, had a very good point. We allow four or five stories in a number of the business districts, and it is absolutely not practical to go up, you know, to go up that high with the floor area ratios, unless you're willing to have a like a five-story building that covers 25 or 30 percent of the lot. Um, so I, I do think rethinking is in order. So two things I would find helpful in terms of you know just trying to you know think about what a a more appropriate set of FAR regulations might be. One would be a sampling of you know sort of a list of some of the non-conforming buildings in our business districts. Uh, the Capitol Theater is an obvious example. I'm sure there are others. The others, the other list I would like, I think would be helpful is a list of one story buildings where that one story buildings that would be, where you'd be unable to add a second story because of FAR regulations. So a one story building with one story buildings that have uh, that are using more than 50% of the floor area ratio already. So thank you. Uh, thanks. That, that's a good, great idea. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, and I, I also echo my, um, my colleagues comments and I'm, I'm really excited to see where you go with this. Um, I think to what Steve was just starting to get to, one of the things that I, I think will be really important um, is, is modeling a little bit of this and, and understanding what the potential is within each of the, the districts based on some of the existing um, really positive examples of um, pre-existing non-conforming structures um, and the potential within some of these spaces that um, is, is unable to be met based on the, the current restrictive FAR requirements. So whether or not that's something that you know you yourself are able to do or whether you're you work with the department, um, again I want to be respectful of the what everything that's on the department's um, uh, list to, to do list right now. And I know that Jenny will certainly be very open with you about what they're able to assist you with and 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 whatnot, um, but whether that's you know for, for this meeting or for an upcoming one, I think it's really in, not only important to um, to really look at those different factors and whether it's you know what the right increase is per per district, but also do, doing a little bit of that modeling and helping people to physically see what this could could look like. Um, I think when that comes to town meeting, that's really impactful and really important to make sure that you have the time to be able to, to do that. Sure, thank you. Did you have any further questions for, for the board? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think, uh, I, I think I, I'm glad that everyone seems to like it. Um, I think you have some good suggestions. So thank Great. you. 
Thank you. I really appreciate you. Everyone, actually, all, all three, um, four people who came before us, um, really looking forward to seeing where all of these head forward. Um, and Jenny, you uh, had an update that you would uh, indicated that you'd like to share with us regarding some of the other zoning board articles that are shaping up. Um, thank you. And um, to all the individuals who previously spoke, I am available to follow up with you and work on the next steps. I know there was a lot to absorb and many questions and comments and um, I will be in touch with you soon. Hope that's okay. I see nodding and thumbs up. Thank you. Um, so you all have seen my memo, but I'm just gonna put it on the screen just for ease of conversation. Um, it's as comprehensive as I could get it to be for now. It doesn't include the proposals, some of the proposals that you heard, um, not all of them, and, and including the other proposals that we've heard in, uh, at past meetings. This is really just an overview uh, similar to the one that we prepared last year, and I think years prior as well, that outlines some of the things that have come from working groups or committees or people working on plans. And so I wanted to bring forth some of those ideas and sort of where they stand and where they might go for the next annual town meeting, but also to suggest that I think due to timing of most of these things, a potentially a proposed special town meeting in the fall of next year, should that be possible. Um, so the things that I wanted to mention are, and, and this is not, this is not comprehensive. This is, this is selective. So there are people participating tonight and perhaps people who are watching who will recall that there is a broader suite of things that have been discussed in some of these groups and as part of these plans. I, this is my, my memo. And so therefore I have handpicked and selected certain items that I feel are perhaps ready to be moved on to a next step. So um, in that spirit, actually, the number one thing is what I think we have all just heard and have definite consensus on that we need to work on the business zoning districts. That seems to be the top priority of both the board and from members of the community. Um, the way that the board talked about it versus the way that the Zoning Bylaw Working Group talked about it in relationship to zoning audits that have been performed is somewhat different. Um, I think the board had a, I'm going to go through my whole memo, if that's okay, Rachel. Okay. Um, the, um, you know, there's a, it's a little bit more comprehensive in terms of what was uh, lifted up in the zoning audits that needs to be adjusted. The board in its um, development of goals had a more reduced number of things. And then of course, we just heard of a potential warrant article that just focuses on FAR. So I think that in general, though, I would like to focus on this, but I would like it to be, uh, I can focus on a, a portion of it, but I would, I would prefer that it is something that is much more comprehensive as suggested originally. Um, and I see that as being a priority issue. Um, the other things that are noted here are other items that come from the Zoning Bylaw Working Group that are of interest. They include reducing the number of uses requiring special permits. We've talked about this. Amending um, the special permit for large additions. Um, we have also discussed this in the past, though this board does not have any review of those special permits for large additions. They fall under the Zoning Board of Appeals. We have had a lot of feedback over time with regard to uh, both that process and the practice and then what the zoning bylaw says. Um, we've also heard from the Zoning uh, Board of Appeals the issue of parking issues that exist in the bylaw as well as from this board. We've certainly tackled commercial parking, but now we're starting to hear some ideas about residential parking. Um, we also briefly discussed amendments to standards for townhouses. This one is a little bit more comprehensive in that we would need to address the districts where you can allow townhouses. It's not as simple as just a, a use change or standards. It is where they're actually allowed. So that one is a little bit more broad. Um, and so I've suggested that, and at the very end of this memo, there's an outline of a nice summary that outlines which, which things fall under what I'm proposing for different town meetings. So I'm gonna, I'll wait till the end to talk about that. 
Then, of course, the board is aware of various long range plans that have been taking place that we are in the process of wrapping up the year long housing plan process, which will be a little bit more than a year when it is actually officially wrapped up. Um, it'll be before the board uh, for your first review and discussion on the 16th. Looking forward to that. And it, uh, as you may know or have seen already, includes many recommendations for future zoning as well as other policy issues to be amended. Um, and there's a time period that it will be reviewed by the redevelopment board as well as by the select board with a number of priorities on certain. It is only a five year plan. But I do want to say and state here that the department is committed to concluding the finalization of the plan and getting it adopted prior to advancing amendments. I think that it's important to carry out the full conclusive and conclude the process um, and to make sure that we gain all of the input towards the end to codify it in the final plan uh, before we move that, fo that forward. That said, a lot of the things that we're hearing about perfectly align with the housing plan and its recommendations. And so it's up to the board to decide what to do about those things. It's not just the housing plan, though some of these things do also, as noted by prior uh, people who have spoken this evening, also aligns with the master plan. Um, we've completed three long range plans this year. Connect Arlington, which is the town sustainable transportation plan, the net zero action plan, which is to get to net zero carbon emissions by 2050, as well as the fair housing action plan. All of these things have various zoning recommendations. And so I wanted to note that um, in particular, one overlapping issue is what well, we're going to hear about amendments related to the uh, net zero action plan at a future meeting, uh, particularly around solar access. But uh, the parking, residential parking issues are tied both to the Connect Arlington plan as well as the Fair Housing Action Plan, though there are some specific uh, differences. I uh, then just want to say that, um, and I think I've just said that there. Uh, there's some other, there's additional items from the Fair Housing Action Plan as well. And then I just want to say, lastly, as promised, uh, give you an update about the recommendations related to the MBTA communities, housing choice. Um, still don't have anything from the state yet. The expectation at this point is there will be a release sometime this month. Um, that will include guidance. And when we receive that, perhaps we can bring that to a board meeting and have a discussion about it and provide feedback to uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development, I believe will be collecting uh, the comments, um, but it will not be in any sort of shape to be ready to file a warrant article for the next uh, annual town meeting. So with that said, here's the su suggested summary timeline that I'm looking at, which would be that for 2022 annual town meeting, I think these four articles are something that we could work on through our staff. Amending the special permit for large additions, the first one. The second one is amending dimensional and parking requirements for multifamily and the other parking requirements that have been brought up. Um, amending the uh, solar ready recommendations, that would be mostly an amendment to the environmental design review, but might also be relevant in other sections of the bylaw. I have to um, investigate that further. Um, and then the amendment to allow two family homes by right, um, which would be uh, something that we have heard about. The special town meeting in the fall, which is the one that I believe really requires a little more time and energy and input, uh, relates to the amendments for the commercial corridors, which we have talked about and which the board agreed when we set goals that we would aim for a fall town meeting to uh, realize uh, those potential amendments followed by recommendations from the housing plan. Um, and then of course, amendments related to the MBTA communities. By then we should have uh, sufficient information and time to prepare. So now I'll stop talking, Rachel. Thank you, Jenny. I appreciate the You're comprehensive welcome. overview and the multi-step plan that we have for moving forward with all of, all of these um, I think very necessary. Uh, uh, revisions and potential warrant articles. So um, I'll open it up to the board for any questions that you might have for Jenny, starting with Jean. Yeah, just, just a couple of things. If you can move to the top of the first page. 
where it has um, those numbers, right? One, one, of, one of the things that um, we've talked about on the board that I'd like to suggest be added to number one, which is building height minimums. We had talked about what's the sense of allowing new one-story buildings to be built in the business districts. So I think when we think through what we're gonna do with the building districts, I would suggest adding building height minimums as part of that package. Um, second is, and I, I generally agree with this and I really appreciate Jenny providing this to us. Um, the number two uses requiring special permits in there is a lot different than at the end because one of the problems with uses requiring special permits is they're required for three family homes and townhomes and apartment buildings, which is a lot different than we want to change what special permits are required for commercial development. And I just want to raise that because what got down on the last page is different than what's up here. And what I understood number two to be was broader, included all of the um, things that make it difficult to build housing in town and not simply commercial. So I wanna make sure that distinction is maintained and we don't lose it when we get down to the last page. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Those are the two things. Jenny, you looks like you have something to. Oh, I just want to understand. Um, are Jane, are you saying you want the whole, the whole, all of the review of all of the uses for a special permit? Or I was focusing on commercial since that's what I was trying to make the focus. No, I well, that's interesting because I understood I, that, but I understood the discussion being broader. It was broad. Yeah, and it I was more time timing wise. And I and um. I think it's important if we're going to do things coming out of the um, how new housing production plan um, that um, that would include, you know, taking a look at where special permits are required for residential development. Um, we, we I, have, I, have, I have a lot more skepticism about how much we want to scale back special permits for commercial development than I do about, I think, the need to scale them back for residential development. And we, it certainly won't be lost on the, the broader issues, um, but I, I do, I, I understand what you're saying. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else, Jean? Nope, thank you so much. Great, thank you. Good. Thanks, Jenny. This is good. Um, I think uh, this allows us to focus on and what we want to do. And I agree with you. I think we should really focus on the, uh, the business quarter and, and that area right now that's sort of misrepresented right now, or not misrepresented, not represented enough right now. I guess that's a better word. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> misrepresented, but uh, I think this is good. So thank you. Great, thank you, Ken. Melissa? Um, yep, thank you, Jenny, for this. I think, um, and just help me understand with regard to the bullet point one under special town meeting, which is the focus on commercial corridors. Um, is it a matter of timing and bandwidth that that cannot get plugged in into the annual town meeting? It would be challenging. We, and it's, as we discussed during our goal setting meeting, it's, there's a lot that would be, there are a number of zoning districts. There are many, many properties that would be impacted. Many conversations need to happen that have yet to occur. I am going to be, I will, will not have my um, all full staff still um, into the spring. And that includes um, how we liaise with the business community. I think it's not possible at this particular moment in time. That said, 
um, I'm still willing to work on the FAR proposal that we had just previously heard and see right. what, we can, what we can do with that um, okay. while also understanding that we want to work on the broader issues, move that forward as well. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think my sense is just, you know, given that the commercial corridors have been of, of focus and interest in, in where we wanted to target that if we could, um, you know, through the organization of this even, you know, kind of, you know, amplify that message that the ARB is working on this even at the at 20 at the annual town meeting. So that it is one of those bullets and that it doesn't look like we're just focusing on housing at the annual town meeting, I guess. That's my thought. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Steve? Uh, yes, I I think the I, I think the timeline makes sense. Uh, I just have one question about the DHCD guidance for MBTA communities. I'm sort of expecting DHCD to issue draft guidance, take comment for some other pe some period of time, go back and think about the think about the go back and consider their feedback, and then at some point after that issue final guidance is that usually how that sort of thing works that is usually how that sort of thing works yes okay, I, so I anticipate that sometime i would guess march maybe april we'll have something final okay so december 5th this mid-december is really the first step where we where we actually get you know it's where we get our first impression rather than a final thing Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you all. And thank you so much to Jenny for putting these together and um, helping to clarify the outline of how we'll be moving forward. You're welcome. Um, I'm sorry. I just, Rachel, I just realized there were two things that I completely left off. And I super, I very much Go apologize for, for that. I, I just, two other, they're very quick. That one is actually, related to um, street activation. Um, so we, we could perhaps talk about this at a at, on the meeting at the 20th on the 20th, but um, uh, potentially like an enhanced business district, which would be an overlay to maintain an active street, which I think has come up during some of our public hearings recently. We, we don't want to see inactive storefronts and you know just sort of limited use, spaces occupied by, for example, banks, offices, lobbies, and other non-active uses, and to create some sort of enhancement um, in the zoning bylaw that would require that a certain portion of a Massachusetts Avenue or other Broadway uh, kind of facing building would be required to have a certain percentage of the building that remains active so that we can limit the number of non-active uses. That was one. The other one is a requirement related to street trees. Um, for any as part of our site standards, which has frequently come up in our reviews, but is not technically uh, a requirement. And so I would like to find a way to, to codify a couple of the things that I think we've continually seem to discuss and provide as feedback to applicants, uh, but perhaps could uh, make um, part of the bylaw. So those were two other things. Thank you for giving me that extra time. <laughs> Sure. Thank you, Jenny. And to confirm, were you looking at those for the potential um, special town meeting? I was actually thinking those would go to our annual town meeting. In the spring? In the spring. Okay. Thank you. And so what I would say is that for uh, the first meeting in January, whenever it is, um, we would be able to start sharing some draft language, uh, very draft early language of a warrant article not the language of a vote, but at least of the warrant article so that we can start talking about that because you have really only your two meetings in January before the deadline for the warrant article filing. Great, Great. thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, just uh, perhaps with a show of hands, any uh, questions on those last two items that Jenny uh, just discussed from the members of the board? Steve. 
Yes, it's um, it's well, it's more of a comment than a question, uh, and it's perhaps a little bit out of our jurisdiction, meaning that it's maybe a better topic for the next time we meet with the select board. But in terms of um, you know, increasing the amount, the number of street trees and the the tree canopy along you know business districts, um, I I think it's worth considering, you know, there's possibly convert you know at least talk about the idea of converting some parking spaces into um space for you know additional pedestrian space or planting spaces but like i said it's a comment <laughs> great thank you steve melissa did i see you raise your hand um yeah i just wanted to say um you know kind of recognize that this is you know a a great effort to put this forward as well, Jenny. So thank you. Um, I think um, in terms of activation, I'm just curious with an overlay, um, how you see the mechanics of that working versus, um, I'm, I'm not sure if there's an option to creating that as it, are we gonna still make it work with the overlay? Sometimes I feel like they're not as effective. The moment I'm not I'm not sure I I I probably use the term overlay but it didn't I didn't mean it as an overlay district um, so I I think it would be in addition to the other requirements in business districts. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Any other questions for Jenny before we uh, move on to our next agenda item? All right. Thank you very much. So our uh, that concludes agenda item number two. Agenda item number three is uh, the MOU uh, for the central school uh, between the Town of Arlington Controller's Office and the Redevelopment Board. So Jenny, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, so we've got two items here. One is an MOU, let me bring it up, between the board and the Office of the Controller Office has an EI, I know that. Um, the um, this is necessary because they've moved into, as I've mentioned at prior meetings, we we have the town yard, read, uh, you know, under development, and of course the high school. And so during the time that the those buildings are under construction, we've need to move a lot of offices, town offices around. So currently, the comptroller needs to occupy one of the vacant office suites at uh, the central school building. 20 Academy Street. Um, and so I used the, the similar format of the MOU for the 23 Maple Street that was uh, reviewed and approved by the board and uh, just wish to put something in place that establishes um, an understanding between the board and their office about how, how things operate um, to have that documented in writing while they are occupying the space before they return back to the high school um, in the future. Great, thank you, Jenny. So do you that, want to... that's that MOU. Do you want to do this first and then the next one? Uh, sure, we can, take, we can take questions on this one and then we'll move to the, to the next item. So I'll just run through and see if anyone has any questions on this, starting with Jean. Yes, I, I mean, all the wording seems fine to me. My one question is, how do you determine what the amount of rent I um I just didn't get a chance to confirm how much rent they are planning to provide, um, if any. I mean, it, that, uh, you know, it, it's a town department, so they don't typically pay rent for the spaces that they occupy. Um, this happens to be a building where we typically collect rent. Um, so I, I'm going to have to talk with the comptroller's office about uh, and the and the finance office and department about what can be paid. So I didn't have that in advance of this meeting, unfortunately. No, that's so it'd be fine. Something. I, I just even wondered whether it made sense for the controller's office to pay if they're just coming in for a year because they've been you know, temporarily moved out. So I would leave that to whatever you're able to work out, but I just wondered about that. We required it of the other in the other MOU, so I wanted to maintain that possibility here. Okay. 
Great. Thank you, Gene. Ken? Oh, I have no questions. This is fine. Uh, we've done this in the past. I'm okay with this. Great. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, no questions. Great. Thank you, Steve. No questions. I have no questions either. Um, do you want us to um, go ahead and authorize execution of the documents one by one, Jenny? No, you can do them together. I, I think um, the other one is a lease extension um, for our current lease agreement with the Contributory Retirement Board. Um, they occupy actually the space, the suite next door to the one that we were just talking about. Um, and so this is simply extending their lease agreement um, from November 1st, 2023 to November 1st, 2025. Okay, so we'll run through again and see if there's any questions or comments, starting with Dean. Do they pay rent? They pay rent, yes. Should, should we, usually when leases are up for renewal, the rent goes up? The rent term stays the same. Basically, it, it has an annual, the annual increase factor, so that the would adjustment factor. That would continue. All of the other terms of the lease would be the same with the exception of the term. Okay. I can make that point. If Great. necessary. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jean. Ken? No. Melissa? No. Thank you, Steve? No questions. And I have no questions either. Uh, let's see. So at this point, um, I think we'd be looking for a motion to authorize the chair and the director to execute. Uh, both of the documents. So the two documents are the MOU between the Town of Arlington Comptroller's Office and the ARB and the lease extension for the Arlington Contributory uh, Retirement Board. I'll, I'll make that motion with the addition that the amount of rent in the MOU with the Comptroller's Office is as negotiated by Ms. Ray. So noted. Second. Great, right, we'll take a vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Uh, so uh, the motion carries, and uh, Jenny and I will work to execute both of these documents with the amendment um, as proposed by Jean on the uh, lease extension. Great. Thank you all. Thank so you. that. Uh, concludes agenda item number three. We now go to agenda item number four, which is the ARB meeting schedule. So Jenny, if you could pull that up. We'll then just review the upcoming meetings, January through April, which brings us to the start of town meeting. Uh, Jenny, anything particularly of note that you wanted to point out? It looks like we have first and third Monday, except we're altered by holidays, and um, every Monday in March, as we start working through to town meeting. You've summarized it so well. No, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the, the, but please note, though, that the, I've, the, all those Mondays in March and even the April meetings might are subject to change depending upon what is actually filed for warrant articles and how many meetings we really need to go through all of the hearings. So that's just what we've done in prior years. So I wanted to do the same. I've also cut it off in April because that's technically the end of our remote hearing, our remote meeting um, you know, uh, ability. So I figured we would end there and see what happens. I believe town meeting, unless there's a, action by the governor or uh, some sort of special action by the town, um, we will need to have an in-person annual town meeting. So I think at that point, we will be transitioning back to in-person meetings unless something changes. So that's why I cut it off in April. Not because I ran out of Mondays. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, I'll just run through and see if there's any questions um, or comments on the proposed schedule before we take a vote to um, adopt the meeting schedule through April 2022, starting with Jean. Uh, no comments. Thank you. Ken? No. Nope. Melissa? No. Steve? No comment. This looks good to me as well. So there is there a motion to uh, 
approve the uh, the ARV meeting schedule of January through April 2022. So moved. So, second. Great, thanks. Uh, we'll take a roll call vote. Gene? Yes. Ken? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. I'm a yes as well. That closes item number four. Um, so we already uh, disposed of item number five. So that brings us to agenda item number six, which is open forum. Uh, so at this time, we'd like to go ahead and welcome any member of the public who is joining us this evening to please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to um, address the, the board. Um, if so, you'll be given up to three minutes of speaking time. And uh, let's see, we have our first uh, person who is going to be speaking to the board. I'll, before you speak, I'll just remind you to please introduce yourself with your first last, first and last name and address. Uh, so the first person will be Sanjay Newton. Sanjay Newton, um, 32 Ottawa Road. Um, and I just wanted to uh, take a, a quick second. I won't talk about um, uh, Zavid's far amendment because I was pleased to hear you guys will all be very supportive of what he's doing. Um, and so I was glad to hear that. Um, in terms of the, the two family, um, I, I would say to some of the concerns I heard from, from board members, you know, um, in most of our neighborhoods, or at least in mine, the two families already exist, right? Uh, I live in a single family house and around the corner from me are several two families. Um, and I, you know, I would say one of the board members mentioned um, the two families that I know have families living in them, right? That that is the entry level housing that exists in town, right? That the young families, many young families that are moving to Arlington, that's that's where my friends have moved is into a, a two family, um, and that's where they've started their family. Um, and so uh, I think that the chance to do more of that would be great. Um, the town is going to change, um, and it, the, our choice is, do we want giant houses, single families, or do we want something else? And um, personally, I would love to see something else. I think a lot of other people would too. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other member of the public wishing to speak this evening? Let's see, the next person will be Chris Loretti. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. Um, just a, a few comments on the proposed uh, zoning articles. I guess I was a little confused by the planning director's memo related to the two-family zoning because it spoke of the, um, um, the changes applying in nominally single-family districts where two-family dwellings were historically commonplace. I think from the, as I understand the conversation, is, is what it really applies to is all single family districts. And as someone who lives in a two family district, I don't feel that strongly about this, but I think, I think you need to, be, need to be transparent about that. And I think you ought to be transparent about what a terrific way this will be to gentrify the town. Um, because what you'll do is you'll increase the price of those single family homes. So they're no longer available as a starter family, a starter home for families. And you'll create two units, both of which are more expensive than the single family home they displace. So it'll be great for that and it'll be great for tax revenue. It will not be great for affordability. Um, as far as Ms. Thornton's article goes, um, I'm not a royal like her and I don't expect to ever be a royal. So I have no idea what she was talking about because I didn't see the proposal even though it was apparently sent to the redevelopment board. I would ask that for any of these zoning amendments, you post all of the documentation with your agenda so that the public can know uh, what the meeting materials are, because otherwise we're just guessing based on, on the comments. And then as far as the FAR one goes, um, you also have to consider both parking and open space, because I think contrary to the comments that were made, and the current FAR limits are not that far off if the development for mixed use, which are predominantly residential use, comply with the usable open safe space requirements and if the board requires a reasonable amount of parking on the site. 
Um, now, if you're going to not apply the zoning bylaw, particularly with regard to open space, as has been done for some of the um, mixed-use developments like the HCA property on Broadway or the development next to the high school, then, then indeed, yes, you do have to increase the FAR. But if you're going to keep the open space requirements, and I hope you will, then I think you'll find that they're really not that far off. And finally, I would just end by asking or, say, or, or noting that when I first got on this call on my phone, I was kicked off for some reason by the host. And I would ask that um, you try to be careful not to do that, because once that happens, you cannot get back on the call through Zoom. It, it keeps you out. So anyway, that, that's all I have right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, members of the public wishing to speak this evening? Let's see, the next speaker will be James Fleming. Uh, camera fails. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Fantastic, uh, James Fleming, 58 Oxford Street. I love the FAR article, it's really good. Um, uh, whether or not it's residential is not up to us, it's up to whoever ends up building it. Um, and uh, for the two-family article, I'm interested in both of those because business can't survive without customers. And so by doing the um, higher FAR and by doing two-family, you're creating more customers for business, which means you can have more stable business and you can have, if you're lucky, you can have a more greater variety of business, um, which are all good things. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Is there anyone else uh, wishing to speak this evening? Okay, seeing none, we will close uh, the open forum for this evening. And we will uh, take a motion to adjourn. Ken, you're muted. So motioned. Okay. Second. Great. Uh, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Kim? Yes. King? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Have a great night.